Hello everyone and welcome back to another AAC video. For those of you coming across the Animal Artist Collective for the first time, we are a group of artists here on YouTube founded by Jennifer Charlie and myself. We create artwork every other month in order to raise awareness and donation funds for various conservation efforts around the globe. In 2019, our theme is animal groups, and this month we're going to be talking about the order Carnivora. You've likely heard of carnivores before, which are any animal that eats exclusively meat, but the order Carnivora is a specific group of mammals. These mammals have teeth and claws primarily adapted for eating other animals, however, confusingly so, not all animals in this category of mammals are in fact carnivores. Carnivorans are divided into two suborders, the feliforms, which are cat-like, and the caniforms, which are dog-like. The suborder Feliformia includes cats, mongooses including meerkats, malagasy mongooses like fusas, civets, hyenas, and ardwolves. Suborder Caniformia includes all dogs, wolves, foxes, and other dog-like animals, bears, seals, sea lions, red pandas, skunks, raccoons, coatis, weasels, otters, and more. With so many options to choose from, I had a lot of animals on my list that I was really excited to paint for this round. And then the news of the Amazon fires hit the U.S. I do thoroughly enjoy getting to flex my zoo educator roots through these AAC videos, and I'm generally prepared to take on difficult conversations like how to help champion for endangered species, as well as my viewpoints on sustainability and how that impacts my daily life, such as which art supplies I prefer to use and what I choose to eat. However, the topic of this video isn't something I ever really wanted to discuss at any point on this channel. However, I have had a lot of people asking me about these fires in the Amazon rainforest over the past few weeks, and I thought that this video was probably the best way to address those questions. The reason I'm putting this disclaimer out at the top of the video is because the issues surrounding these fires aren't simple, nor are they really natural. These fires are directly caused by humans, and the discussion around them is a very political conversation, which a lot of people don't really seem to either realize or want to talk about. While I would ease you into this heavy conversation, perhaps first by talking about my super cute animal subjects, the actual artistic painting process required me to paint the background vignette first, which depicts more of that political conversation. So let's go ahead and get straight to it, and we'll come back around to the bush dog. I do want to start off by saying, as an American, having never been to Brazil myself, I cannot sit here and claim to fully comprehend the political or cultural state that Brazil is in solely based on a couple weeks of research. I can say that I tried my best to find fair and non-biased news sources, several of which I've linked in the descriptions below, but given that we didn't even hear about these fires until a few weeks ago, when they've been happening actually for decades, shows bias and limitation of our available media access in and of itself. So anyway, I tried my best, and for a rare moment on this channel, we're going to spend some time talking about the social, economical, aka political reasons, for endangered and threatened species in the Amazon rather than the animals themselves. Alrighty, so here in the US, the news broke of the Amazon fires in the same way that our US news presents pretty much everything these days. It was extremely sensationalized. They were often referred to as, in quotes, wildfires, and of course they played into the things that we already know and care about, like all the wonderful wildlife that are losing their homes. While this is, of course, important, these wildfires aren't natural in a sense like the headlines would have us believe, and they involve many more components than just those sweet animals. Here in North America, naturally caused fires, and of course I'm not talking about arson or power company malpractice, is a part of our natural life cycle for many of our forests. Certain plants might actually need periodic fires in order to survive. However, natural wildfires are not a common occurrence in places like the Amazon rainforest, where they historically have seen an average of 120 inches of rain per year, and in some areas, even up to 400 inches. These forests are not adapted to survive fire, and this form of trauma can be severe and deadly. As Hank Green stated in his video addressing this topic a couple weeks ago, the Amazon is not burning, it is being burned, and that's a very important distinction. Burning is the final step in the deforestation process of converting rainforest into agricultural land. It clears vegetation and makes the soil more fertile. 
But this hasn't just been happening this year. It's been happening for decades with huge peaks in the early 2000s and increasing again this year. So the next questions we have to ask are why are we only hearing about it now and what is the root of the problem? To answer the first question from a foreigner's point of view, the internet is thriving much more than it was 15 to 20 years ago, which means that we have better access to worldwide news, but with that we have also gained that sensationalized, omnipresent media in today's culture with headlines that are specifically crafted to get clicks, reshares, retweets, and spark that uh, emotional response in us, regardless of whether or not what the headline says is accurately conveying the whole picture which of course it usually isn't. For the second question, we have to be willing to get political and remember that all of this is happening in a country where most of the people watching this video do not actually live and therefore it's much more difficult for any of us to have a say in what's actually going on. We may know how important the Amazon rainforest to literally every living thing on this planet, but like after the US for instance decided to decimate nearly all of its own forests over the last several hundred years, who the heck are we to go telling another country what they can and can't do with their land? Do you see why that's complicated? Brazil is not getting paid by the rest of the world to keep oxygen flowing out of and carbon dioxide flowing into this forest. What they are getting paid for is agribusiness. They are getting paid for the cattle, soy, corn, and cotton that they produce on the land that was cleared by deforestation and burning. Another reason why all of this is coming to light now during 2019 is that in January, Brazil elected a, we'll say nationalist to keep it humane, though there are many other words that I would like to use to describe this person after the atrocious things that I've read. Anyway, he is a nationalist who holds his country above all else, who has seen his country struggling through an economic stagnation, and who will stop at seemingly nothing to turn the rainforest into profit. Seriously, guys, if you don't know about this person, this deplorable racist is on record saying that, quote, it is a shame that the Brazilian cavalry wasn't as efficient as the Americans who exterminated the Indians. And furthermore, he's also said that he wants to take every millimeter of land away from the indigenous people left in Brazil. You can't rationalize keeping endangered species protected when the person that you're talking to praises human genocide. It's not a conversation that's going to go anywhere. But you would think that a man that is so concerned with profit and glory would be willing to use logic and science to see the catastrophic downfall that they are headed for if they continue on this path. This government, along with many other people in the world, don't seem to understand the risks of deforestation, not only what it means for the world as a whole, but also for their very own country that they're trying to improve. We all know that it rains in the rainforest, but it doesn't just happen to rain there by coincidence. These plants themselves make the rain happen. Trees physically hold water inside of them until it evaporates back into the atmosphere above that said ecosystem. When you take away those trees, agricultural fields do not have the same capacity to hold water that the trees did, and that water instead will run off of the land and flow back into other aquasystems. When you take away those trees, you're taking away that land's ability to hold water, which means it's not going to rain as much, which means that it will be drier. Thus, in addition to being prone to more actual wildfires, the agricultural land itself won't be as viable in years to come if the rain continues to taper off and stops watering your crops. According to one of the PBS videos that I watched during my research, they actually took the temperature of cleared land just outside of the rainforest, which averaged 10 degrees higher than the temperatures directly next to it inside of the rainforest. Humans did that. It's an empirical fact that can be measured, and it's not subject to interpretation. We remove the trees, it gets hotter and drier, period. In addition to this, if you look on a map, the Amazon rainforest is actually closer to the equator than the Sahara Desert is. It gets more solar energy. The only thing keeping it from being a barren wasteland is the forest itself and its ability to use, create, and recycle its own water. By clearing those forests to make agricultural land, you're subjecting that land to suffer the same fate as a desert. 
So the root of this problem when it comes to many of these environmental issues is that the so-called leaders that continue to be short-sighted and refuse to look at scientific evidence, along with anyone who blindly follows them without doing their own research, are literally sentencing our land to death by clearing it of our natural resources until there won't be anything either profitable or hospitable left for any of us in time. Conservation is always a multifaceted issue, and this current event demonstrates that to the fullest extent. We cannot save wildlife without addressing what is causing their land to be taken from them in the first place, which in this case is a group of humans' desire to survive at any cost in the short term, even if it means hurting themselves or their progeny in the long run. So what the heck are we all supposed to do, and how do we do it? Well, there are actually lots of things that we can do if we're willing to put a little bit more effort into it. First, I'm going to encourage you to pay attention to what you buy. I know it's time consuming and it's a pain in the tush to have to check every single label, but it's free and anyone can do it. Regarding Brazil specifically, you can look for rainforest crops like coffee and chocolate that are shade grown. This means that they are grown under the trees of the existing rainforest canopies and are not grown in deforested land. It also supports the farmers that are working and earning a living while also protecting the natural habitat. Here in the U.S. and hopefully other places as well, you can look for the Rainforest Alliance little green frog logo on rainforest-based products to easily determine which of these brands are specifically working towards not only wildlife and land conservation, but also ethical fair trade of local farmers. The latter part of that sentence is really important because if we stop supporting all products from a given area, that will just make the economic situation worse. Instead, choose products that support the practices that you want to see reflected. In addition to coffee and chocolate, you can also find Rainforest Alliance certified fruits, teas, paper products, printing services, soaps, furniture, and more. There's a really neat tool and I'll leave a link to their product finder in the description below. Oh, and regarding produce, a lot of people are under the impression that buying organic isn't really important for things that you're not eating the skin of, like bananas. But do keep in mind that tropical fruits like bananas are grown in the rainforest, so when pesticides are used on those crops, even though it might not be affecting you, it does affect the environment. I'll also include a link in the description for the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 guides to help you navigate which produce to prioritize. Another food-related thing that you can do to help is to reduce your general beef consumption, and specifically in this case, avoiding pre-packaged grass-fed beef that is imported from Brazil. I know, I know, it says grass-fed beef and that's supposed to be better, right? Well, it is better treatment for those specific cattle that aren't being caged like many of them are here in the U.S., but grass-fed cattle from Brazil means that forest was cleared to let them graze. Many people ask me if I'm a vegetarian or a vegan based on my love for animals, but my answer is no, not strictly. What I do try to do though is eat as sustainably as possible, not only considering the animal's welfare, but also the environmental impact as well. That's why in addition to drastically lowering my beef consumption, I've also avoided lamb, palm oil, and conventional crops that use heavy amounts of pesticides. You might also have heard me talking about the Seafood Watch program, which allows you to find out more about sustainable seafood options too. Watching what we buy is helpful, but more importantly, you can make sure that you're informed about what's going on in the world and vote. While most of us watching this video may not live in Brazil and be able to affect those directly, there are many things at home that we can vote on. I've heard so, so many people over the years say, especially when I lived in California, that their vote didn't matter. And while it might not matter if liberals in California vote on the final presidential elections due to the heavy blue nature of the state, your vote always matters for local, congressional, and primary elections. There are dozens and dozens of decisions to be made throughout the years, not just every four years. And the people that you vote into office matter, no matter the office. Please, please vote in any country that you're in if you have the privilege to do so, because those choices do matter. When you don't, we end up in the situation that we're currently in, both internationally and domestically speaking. Finally, of course, there are ways that you can contribute financially to the current situation in Brazil, which I'll talk a little bit about after finally explaining what's going on in this painting. 
So art, that is what this channel is usually about, right? As you can tell by now, the piece is quite different from my normal portraits. As I mentioned at the top of the video, I had several other species in mind for the well-known members of Order Carnivora. However, with the news of the fires and having already painted a jaguar for our very first AAC video, I decided to choose a little-known critter that is being directly affected by the situation, the bush dog. The bush dog is a canid found in South and Central America centered around the Amazon basin. While it can be found across a wide range, the species is usually rare inside of the areas that it does live in and it's classified as near threatened by the IUCN. It is the only living species of its genus and the closest living relative is the maned wolf, also found in South America. They are small animals about as tall as a corgi, but they weigh less than 20 pounds. Their fur would overall be categorized as brown, with their heads being a lighter reddish yellow and their legs and tails being dark brown or black. They also have webbed toes, which allows them to become more adept swimmers. Bush dogs are diurnal animals, meaning they're awake during the day, and they're usually found in small packs. They typically hunt large rodents like pacas, agoutis, and even capybaras, and larger packs may even take down larger animals like peccaries and rheas. Given the topical and pressing nature behind this piece, I wanted to make it more than just a portrait. I think it's the first time since my walrus painting that I felt it was really important to add additional context to the overall artwork. After listening to this video, I'm sure that it's very easy to tell what's going on, but just in case I wasn't obvious enough, the background vignette shows a cow grazing at the edge of a forest while fires are approaching from the other side clearing the land to make way for grass. The bush dog is displayed in the front vignette, standing by rather helplessly while all this happens around him. I used Daniel Smith watercolors on Arch's 140 pound cold press paper with my silver black velvet brushes. One of the goals of the AAC is to raise not only awareness, but also funds for various conservation efforts around the world. While I did heavily take that into consideration, when I made the concept for this piece, I felt that the message was more important than whether or not I could ultimately sell the final artwork. I am completely aware that this is a rather sad depiction of a very serious issue and might not be something that people want to hang on their walls. So while this painting will be available for sale with 50% of the profits going to conservation efforts, I have another request to make. If this video has inspired you and you are able to do so, I would love it if you could consider making a direct donation to one of the many conservation efforts I listed in the description. There are various organizations that support wildlife, indigenous people, land preservation, and all of the above so that you can pick the one that really speaks to you personally. If you do, I would love it if you could let me know about your contribution either in the comments below this video or privately on Instagram or via email so that we can add it to the Animal Artists Collective end of year totals. I pull these numbers together to allow our viewers to know how much we were able to raise and to which organizations we were able to donate to throughout 2019 for the AAC. I thank you for that consideration and for making it this far into the video. I'm sorry that today was really dang heavy, but I hope that it helped address the questions that came my way and to bring a little bit more light to the multifaceted approach that is conservation. It really boils down to education, awareness, and economical alternatives to destroying natural habitats for the people living in those areas. Feel free to share this video with others to help spread awareness, and be sure to check out those other resources in the description if you want to learn more about the wildfires in Brazil. There's only so much that I could possibly squeeze into this video, and besides, the experts and the people of Brazil probably know a bit more about this than I do. Thank you all for your love, support, open hearts, and open minds. Be sure to let me know if you enjoyed this video by giving it a like and or comment, and as always, an endless thank you to my patrons for helping keep me and Cricket afloat. Until next time, happy painting, and go kick some conservational butt.